So let's have a look at this last example. We want to find the surface area of the torus. Well, the first thing to observe is that this is actually a surface of revolution. What's being revolved? Well, we start with a circle. It's going to be centered here at big R. That's the distance that this circle in the diagram is from the center. And it's a circle of radius little r. So this is r plus little r out here on the x-axis, and this is r minus little r. That's the thing that's being revolved around the y-axis. So the thing to notice here is that there's really two halves here. There's a top half and a bottom half. And so what I can do is I can just ignore the bottom curve and focus on just revolving the top curve around the y-axis and then multiply by 2 to get the surface area of what, what results. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say the surface area is twice the surface area of the top half. Okay. So that's the first observation. Now I just need to focus on that upper curve and revolving it around. So what I need to have is a description for that upper curve. Let's put it in a different color maybe. So there, the upper curve is this purple curve. That's the one I'm going to look at revolving. What is it equal to? Well, it might help to start with the full circle. This is a circle that's been translated capital R units to the right. So it's x minus capital R squared plus y squared is equal to little r squared. So the upper semicircle is obtained by taking this expression and solving for y and taking the positive root. There's going to be two roots that I can take for y. Positive root is going to give me the upper half, negative is the bottom half. I want the upper half. So this is going to be r squared minus x minus r all squared. There's our function. That's our f of x. That's the thing we're revolving. Now, for writing down the integral, we're, we're going to need to know the derivative of f in this case. So that's going to be the chain rule on this. It's going to be the derivative of the outside function, which is the square root function. So that's 1 over 2 times the square root of r squared minus x minus r squared times the derivative of the inside function. That's a polynomial in x. And so what I need to do is just look at that second term, x minus r all squared. The derivative of that power rule gives me that it's negative 2 times x minus r. Derivative of the inside, well, x minus r is the inside. The derivative of that is 1. So there's our derivative. I see that there's a common factor of 2 top and bottom. I can get rid of those. And so there's our derivative. Now, maybe I should put that in brackets. That was just an aside. That was one of the ingredients we need in order to write down the next step here. So that's 2 times the integral from, well, we're letting x values run, over, run down the x-axis so that they trace out the curve. They give all the values on the curve. And that goes from capital R minus little r to capital R plus big R. So capital R minus little r to capital R plus little r. That's 2 pi times the radius. What's the radius in this case? Well, at a given x value on the interval that we're integrating over, I go up to the curve, and I say, how far away is that point from the axis of rotation? Well, that's going to be x units away from the axis of rotation. So this is x. And then the arc length differential. So that's 1 plus the derivative squared dx. And what's the derivative? That's what we worked out above. Square root of r squared minus x minus big R squared. So there's the integral. We've gone through all the work, set up the problem, now we've got an integral. This is the integral that gives the surface area for the torus. Now let's go ahead and work it out. So I've got a 2 pi times 2, that's a 4 pi. Note at this stage this is an exercise in integration. There's nothing new going on here, we're just having to evaluate an integral. So this becomes x. Square root of this expression Let's see if we can simplify it in any way. Well, I can get a 1 plus 
the numerator becomes an x minus big R all squared, and the denominator becomes an R squared minus x minus big R all squared. That's dx. Should I expand out the x minus R squared? Probably not, because I see another one in the denominator, and I'm hoping that when I do some collection over common denominators, those will cancel. If I expanded it out, x minus R squared and expanded it out, it may start to hide things. It'll camouflage things that could potentially cancel. So it's always a good idea to know when you should expand something and when you shouldn't. Here I, I seem to be working with quotients and eventually I'm going to put things over common denominators. Probably don't want to expand things out in that context because I hope something's going to cancel. So let's see. If I put it over a common denominator, this whole denominator here gets put on top and the bottom in the ex uh, new expression for 1. And then I see that when I add it to the other one, that they will cancel. This x minus r squared will be a negative in the numerator of the 1, but it's positive here, so they will cancel. And what's left over is just an r squared up top. And the whole new denominator is r squared minus x minus r all squared dx. Okay, so the only thing I did was added 1 to this expression by putting it over a common denominator. Now when I take the square root, I get square root of r squared, that just becomes r. I can push that all the way out front because that's just a constant. Then I get x over the square root of r squared minus x minus r all squared dx. Okay, so we've seemed to make, be making some progress. We've now got x over some square root. What can I do now? Well, I kind of don't like the x minus r there. I would like that just to be a single variable, so maybe we can make a substitution. So I'm going to substitute u for x minus r. du is then just dx in this case. What are our limits of integration? Well, our upper limit was x equals big R plus little r, and our lower limit was big R minus little r. In terms of u, this will be what? Well, I plug in big R minus or big R plus little r for x, and I see that the big R's cancel, and I just get an upper limit of little r. By a similar calculation, it gives me that the lower limit is negative r. So there's our substitution and our limit changes. And so this becomes, maybe I'll go back to blue again. This becomes 4 pi r, the integral from negative r to r. x up top gets replaced with a u plus big R. And on the bottom, we have an r squared minus u squared du. Okay, looking much better. Let's see, what else can we do? Well, I can split this integral up into a u over square root of r squared minus u squared du plus the integral from negative r to r of big R over square root of r squared minus u squared du. So I just noticed that the numerator was a sum, so I split it up into the sum of two integrals. Why have I done that? Because this one's zero. Why is that one zero? Well, we're integrating an odd function over a symmetric interval about the origin. This is an odd function. So we can immediately see that the integral is zero. Why is it an odd function? Well, u is an odd function. The u squared in the bottom is an even function, so I've got an odd function divided by an even function. Odd divided by an even function is an odd function. So this becomes then 4 pi little r, big R can factor out of that other integral, the integral from negative r to r of 1 over the square root of r squared minus u squared du. Now we've boiled it all the way down to trying to figure out what this integral is. What's the antiderivative of 1 over r squared minus u squared? Well, that looks very close to an arc sine. 
for arc sine, it would be nice if it was a 1 minus u squared, but instead we have an r squared minus u squared. But I can make a substitution. I could factor out an r squared and get write that as a u over r all squared, uh, and then substitute for that. So at this point, we can fiddle around with it, make a substitution, but the point is, is that the antiderivative in this case is an arc sine. So it's arc sine of u over r. And that's going from negative r to r. And so now I can evaluate at the endpoints. That's arc sine of 1 minus arc sine of negative 1. What's arc sine of 1? Uh, sine of what is 1? That's pi by 2. Sine of what is negative 1? That's negative pi by 2. So this is pi by 2. This is negative pi by 2. I'm taking the difference. So it's pi by 2 plus pi by 2. That's just pi. So this becomes a 4 pi squared r, little r times big R. And there is our result. So that is the surface area of our torus. OK. I want to make one uh, pretty cool connection with the volume of a torus. You may remember back in the volumes lecture. So before, we saw the volume of the torus is, what was the volume? Well, the volume was 2 pi squared r squared, little r squared, times big R. That's what we saw before. Now it turns out that there's a pretty cool connection between the surface area and the volume in this case. Uh, let's imagine we've got our torus and we're, we change the little r value slightly. Remember, little r is the radius of that circle that we used to spin around the axes. So we're changing the little r value a little bit. So what happens? Well, imagine we change, we're at some fixed particular r value and then we increase it slightly. Well then the torus has to increase in volume slightly. By how much does its volume increase? Well, if we increase it slightly, we can imagine that the volume should increase at roughly the surface area times the change in r. So we can imagine that how much did the volume change? The change in volume is roughly the surface area times delta r. Or in other words, the change in volume over the change in r is roughly the surface area. Now, the smaller the change in r is, the better the change in volume over the change in r is approximated by surface area. So what that means is that if we look at the change in r as being really small, we look at the limit as delta r goes to 0 of delta v over delta r, well, that should be exactly equal to the surface area. But what is the limit as delta r goes to 0 of delta v over delta r? Well, that's the definition of derivative. So this is dv dr. So dv dr should be surface area. So what does that mean? It means if I take my volume formula and I differentiate it with respect to little r, I get the surface area. That's a pretty cool connection. And it's not just a connection that the torus has. You can look at other geometric objects and see that this connection holds true as well. Uh, just as a basic example, think of the circle. Think of a circle and what are a couple of properties we have for the circle? Well, we have its circumference, that's 2 pi r, and we have its area, which is pi r squared. And what do we notice? Well, we notice there's a connection here. If I take the area and I differentiate it, I get the circumference. So there is this connection between objects and their lengths, areas, volumes. Um, the key thing is to note how to come up with this connection, how to discover this connection. Notice it took a little bit of thought here in that here I have a volume. What do I need to differentiate respect to to get the surface area? I have two variables here. How come I di didn't choose to differentiate with respect to capital R? Well, that's where that visualization had to come into play. I had to think about what's going on. As I change the little r value, the volume grows a little bit. The volume grows proportional to its surface area. 
So this is where I started visualizing what was going on in order to figure out what variable was the variable that I had to differentiate with respect to to get that connection. But just something I wanted to point out, very, very cool connection between surface area and volume. All right, that's it for this section. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you again next time.